Well, greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Philip Shields, your brother, uh, with today's exciting topic. It's exciting to me as I prepared it. The topic of immersions and baptisms. Some, I prefer actually the title immersions because that's what baptism means. And I say baptisms or immersions because in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, it says the doctrines, uh, in the doctrine section, it says the doctrine of baptisms or immersions. I'm hoping today we'll bring some exciting new uh, outlook to you or insights into a, an old topic that hopefully will be exciting for you to hear and or to review before Passover. Um, when we think of being immersed into something or someone, that opens up all kinds of exciting insights. When an Israelite woman accepted the invitation of a man to be his bride, as Rebecca did to Isaac, when the betrothal ceremony was finished, she would go into an, to a mikvah, a pool of ritual running water, had water that was pumped in it, running through it, and, and was immersed. This pictured her death, or she might be immersed somewhere else, but this pictured her death to herself and living for her, uh, not, not, no longer living for herself now, but a commitment to be immersed and living for her new husband uh, when they get married, and she's fo focused now on that. And she took on his name. She made it her goal to be one with him and to uh, begin a journey together as one. What were formerly two lives would now be one. Well, where two rivers would now be one, if I can put it that way, and they would enter into a covenant, a new covenant with one another uh, for this marriage. Now, this is the same that happens to us when we accepted the invitation to be the bride of Christ, of the Messiah. We confessed our ways that were not in line with his way, called repenting of sins. We turned our lives around to go his way, the fruits of repentance, and we were immersed in water, showing the death of the old self, and we were raised up in newness of life in him. That's all found in Romans 6. Their immersions were in rivers or mikvahs with running water to symbolize life and newness and cleansing. Already we're seeing how special, how profound this concept of immersion is. The woman who was getting ready for marriage would immerse herself to, to symbolize that she's now going to be immersed in the life of her husband, and they together would form one life together. Hebrews 6, like I said, mentions foundational doctrines listed in the order that they actually happen. Repentance from dead worth, works, followed by faith towards God, <clears throat> and then baptism, then lay, or baptisms, then laying on of hands, and so on. And the list of these foundational doctrines is not my topic today, except to say that baptisms or immersion is in the plural. The Bible also speaks that there is also one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. So how can that be? We'll talk about that today, especially if you have time. We'll primarily focus on water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then in the transcript, I may have to rely on a list of scriptures at the end to help those of you who want to further study other baptisms if I run out of time. I think you'll find this message helpful if you're coming to baptism, <clears throat> want to be baptized, you want to accept Jesus the Christ or Yeshua, the Messiah, as your Savior, and uh, or anyone who wants a good review, um, anyone who wants a really good review coming up to baptism and Passover, uh, if a good review before Passover is what I'm thinking of here, uh, of what we each committed to. I think this would be very helpful. I found it very helpful preparing for it. Baptism is about being buried, immersed, going into something. The Greek word baptize means, is, is baptizo, meaning to immerse. I, I could just as well say immersion instead of baptism. Now, why would we even bother with this topic? Turn with me um, to Acts 2, verses 37 to 39. Acts 2, verses 37 to 39. Why even bother with it? Plus, if Yeshua himself was baptized, which he was, uh, that might be a good hint that maybe we should as well be baptized someday. And is baptism part of salvation? When Peter was asked on the day of Pentecost... What the people whose hearts, whose hearts were pricked by his sermon, they said, what shall we do? <clears throat> and let's read how he answered. In Acts 2.37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2, verse 38 now. A key verse here. Peter said to them, repent. That's the first thing you want to do is acknowledge your sins and turn the other way. Repent. 
let every one of you be baptized. So you repent first, then you're baptized. And notice in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua the, the Messiah. Uh, in the name of Christ for the remission of those sins. Brethren, if we don't repent, if we don't have our sins re- remitted, removed, we're still in our sins. We're all men most miserable. We're going to have a dire future. The wages of sin is death. You need those sins canceled. And then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as your Lord, your God, will, our, our, the Lord our God will call. There's a lot in that verse. We'll come back to it a couple times. Repentance has to precede baptism. Baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ or Yeshua the Messiah. And it pictures remission of sins. Next, we receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now let's turn to Mark 16, verses 14 to 17. I'm just explaining the fact that baptism is very, very important. The first thing that uh, Peter said to do after repentance is to make sure you're baptized following that repentance. Mark 16. Turn with me, please, to Mark 16, verses 14 to 17. Or 14 to 16, technically, I guess. And later he appeared to the eleven. This is after the he, uh, Yeshua has been resurrected. He appears to the eleven, and, and they sat at the table. <clears throat> and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they didn't believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So he says to them, he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Sounds to me like it's pretty important that we, in fact, be baptized. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So if you ask the question, is salvation, is baptism required for salvation? I don't know if it's required, but it's, I wouldn't mess with it. I personally would teach, yes, it's something you definitely want to do. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. This seems pretty clear to me. And he who does not believe, and presumably not baptized, will be condemned. So in Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent, be baptized. Mark 16, our king tells us to preach all the world, be baptized, and uh, be saved as as a result. And there's one more in 1 Peter 3.21-22, which we'll read in just a second. I think it's pretty clear there that baptism is vital for salvation. But here's a teaser for you. It's water baptism, the baptism that saves us. Really, you think so? I have a personal view on this that might surprise some of you. But later, turn now to 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. Notice that Peter does not put the emphasis on the water baptism or the washing away of the filth that would be symbolized by the water, but on the spiritual side, the new life, the resurrection. In 1 Peter 3, 21, 22, he's talking before that about the eight souls in the ark Uh, Noah's Ark during the flood and how they were saved from the flood. In verse 21 it says, this is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. He said that's a type of what is the reality. Baptism which saves us, he says. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. I'm reading 1 Peter 3.21. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection. Okay, baptism which saves us, not the water part, the removal of the, of the dirt, but through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So I hope we understand the emphasis that Peter is putting on it there. We see that water baptism is more than a ritual. It's more than a picture. It's more than a ceremony. Baptism publicly shows everyone that you're renouncing the old way of life. You want to bury it. And it doesn't end there. You want to participate in Yahweh's new life for you and our Savior. You've given baptism a lot of thought. And as you come to baptism... As a mature person, you've decided you want to throw your lot in with Yeshua's death and Yeshua's crucifixion and resurrection. You also want his new life and you want to participate, in fact, and be immersed, in fact, also in his resurrection. Uh, The baptism pictures both. Paul said he counted all... I'll read that in just a minute. 
Paul said he counted all things as lost for Christ in Philippians 3. When we come to baptism, when we decide to follow Yeshua, we must be willing to give up our homes, our lands, our parents, our siblings, our children, whatever may be required as God tests our resolve and requires it sometimes. Matthew 19, verse 29 says, If you follow me, and if in this life you give up lands and parents and father, mother, children, wife, spouse, whatever, he then says, but you will receive a hundredfold in the kingdom to come. In baptism, we publicly confess we're giving up everything we have, everything we are for him. I want any of you coming to baptism to really seriously understand that. It's not just a ritual that makes you a member of a church. It's far, far more than that. We're giving up everything we have, everything we are, for Him. He, in turn, gives us everything He is and everything He has. We become co-heirs with Him. Let's read it in Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. I think this is a pretty incredible swap. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself or itself bears witness with our spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Romans 8, 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Heirs of God. How would you like to be an heir of Warren Buffett or an heir of of uh, uh, Bill Gates. You know you'd be pretty wealthy. You know there's a lot coming at some point. Imagine being an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's what baptism's doing with us. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Once we're baptized and have the laying on of hands receive the Holy Spirit, that part makes us an heir of God. We give him all our sins. He gives us all his forgiveness. We give him our filth. And he gives us a brand new, spanking new, clean life. Not an overhauled life. Not a refurbished life. I think we need to understand that, brethren. The life he gives us is a life that has never been before. It's not an overhaul. It's a brand new life. The new creation. Something new is not formerly owned. Something new is not something others have used. Something new has never been in existence or used before. I think we really need to understand that because I hear a lot of people preaching the refurbished concept. That's not what it is. It's a new life. In Revelation 21, verse 7, it says, Whoever overcomes shall inherit all things. We give him all our personal possessions, a couple books and a bicycle and whatever else we own. I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but we don't have much. And he shares the whole universe with us. Like he says, he overcomes shall inherit, Revelation 21, 7, shall inherit all things. What a swap. Baptism is about this and more. Did you realize that? When you and I were being called to baptism, we were being called to a relationship that will culminate in you being part of the very bride of Christ to marry the Son of God. As in all good marriages, we become one with Him and in Him. It all starts with repentance, then baptism, and then laying on of hands. Actually, repentance, then faith in Him and then baptism, then laying on of hands. Water immersion in baptism pictures a public statement. That's the faith part, too, coming up here. That you have repented of your sins, and we have accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as our personal Savior and King. It shows we are willing to be immersed in the Messiah, in all things Messiah. It helps to grasp, I think, the scope and the breadth of this as much as possible as, as we come to baptism. We're agreeing to be immersed in Messiah. I want to keep saying that. I know I've said it a few times. 
But I don't know how many of us now, 15, 20, 30, 40 years after baptism, still are immersed in Messiah. There are many times I have to rededicate myself and have had, have had to. I think many children of God have either forgotten or never learned this vital truth since their baptism. Now let's read Romans 6, verses 1 to 10. This is probably one of the pivotal verses that ex- explains baptism. I think if I had just one passage on baptism, or if I could have four or five, this would certainly be one of them. Romans 6, verses 1 to 10. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, you know what? Remember what I said earlier? We're, we're agreeing to be immersed in him. We're agreeing to publicly recant and confess the, the ways of life that we had that were not going his way. And you and I have to be honest with ourselves. The worst lies to ourselves sometimes. When we try to kid ourselves that we can get away with this little sin or that little sin or this little peculiarity we have or that one, the gossip or the lust or the different things we do or the envy or the whatever it is that our sins are. The vanities we all, we're all so filled with. He says, no, that can't keep going on. We've got to overcome. We've got to fight. We've got to beat these things. He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? A dead man can't live in a particular way anymore. We're supposed to be dead to sin. So Romans 6, 3, don't you know that as many of us who were baptized, who were immersed into Christ Jesus, were immersed, baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through immersion, through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So I, you can go on and read what it says all the way through verse 9 and all that. But, but uh, So baptism is about burial and resurrection. So often the second half about the resurrection part of it is left out. Now think about it, without the resurrection, I've heard many, many sermons talking about baptism picturing the burial, and not as much focus, sometimes it's even totally left out, very little focus, or it's left out, this part about it being also picturing us being resurrected in Christ. But if you're just talking about being buried, we're just dead and buried, good for nothing useful, there's certainly no life there. But there can be no resurrection without a prior death. So yes, we have to die and be buried first. It's signified by the water baptism. That's a symbol, okay? So immersion shows you recognize you need a fresh start. You, you recognize that you accept Yahweh's offer to make you a new creation in Messiah. In baptism, we are starting a profoundly intimate and personal relationship with our Maker. We'll see how this baptism... In baptism, we are participating in one of the major miracles of God that he'll ever perform in our life. And you're right in the middle of it. You are the miracle being worked on by the miracle worker, our Savior. If you've ever wanted to watch a miracle, it's happening to you and me over time when God takes you, a sinner, and makes you a new creation in him starting with repentance, faith, and baptism, and laying on of hands. Now, we've already covered a lot of that here. There's more to get into. Um, I, I, I remember my own baptism much, much more. We're going to talk about who should do the baptizing, how old you should be, and uh, uh, who, who uh, counting the cost, a little bit on repentance. We'll do a lot of that. I remember my own baptism in 1971 after some counseling with a pastor, and discussion about repentance. And I had been convicted by several sermons. I had, and then even more so, several conversations that I'd overheard of senior men who were men of God. Their words, frankly, pricked my heart. Just as the people in Acts 2 were pricked. I once more repented that very night. 1971, I asked God to help me. Help me come to full repentance. To wash me, to cleanse me, to please let me be part of his family. 
I felt a strong calling. I'd actually felt a calling from my childhood, but it wavered at times. So after counseling, I was determined I'd be baptized. As I stood in the watery tank of water, the minister asked me if I'd repented of my sins. It was December 1971. I said, yes, sir, I have repented of my sins. And then he asked me if I'd accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Again, I nodded and said, yes, sir. And then he made the statement of baptism, and I was baptized. Let me say again, this was not just picturing a burial of the Old South, but coming up out of that watery grave. And please get this, a water baptism is not about joining a church or denomination. Although many pastors still make it sound that way, don't they? It's not about becoming a religious person, per se. You know what? I just about had it with religion and churchianity. Big organized churches and all that. I've, I'm, I'm frankly just about had it with it. Even Satan can quote scripture. Even the pagans in Athens were religious. Paul, remember in Acts 17, says, I perceive that you are very religious up here. So there's good, pure religion and there's horrible religion. <clears throat> Baptism is about starting a personal, intimate relationship with your Maker and Savior. It's not about joining a church organization of men. <clears throat> Will you be part of a church? Yes, you will. There is the church of God, the body of Christ. But it's a spiritual organism, and it's not a denomination or man-made organization. That personal relationship is not solitary. We're called to be part of, hopefully, harmonious body of believers. I've been talking about that a lot lately. We've been at each other. We've been stabbing each other in the back. We've been preventing some from fellowshipping with us. We've been putting some up and some down. The body of Christ is fractured and divided right now, just like a body that would be hitting itself, pummeling its own self. We're scattered, but not because of persecution like they were in Acts 8. No, no, we scattered ourselves into competing organizations of men to our shame. That's going to change somehow. And those with eyes to see and those with the heart of God are already now reaching across church lines frequently and have been for years. As I covered in two recent sermons, <clears throat> we'll also be collectively searching for lost sheep who've given up on God, on prayer, on Bible study, on their future, frankly. No one was searching for my sheep, is what the chief shepherd said. I hope that we can ask him to let us find some and not just pray about them, but be actively reconnecting them. We'll not be content to just pray for unity or pray for the lost sheep. It's much, much more than that that he says. He doesn't want us just to have the attitude of be warm, be filled. You're in my thoughts and prayers, as common expression says. And that's pablum. It's much deeper than that. God wants us getting our, ourselves bruised in there, going through the hedgerows and bushes and looking up and down the hills and in the valleys. Where are the sheep? Reconnect with those who don't go anywhere anymore, who don't pray or study anymore, who are turned off and fed up. Just be a friend. That's part of what baptism is about, because you're going to be part of a body. And as it's part of the body you belong to, and you're part of a group of people, and you love them, and will do your best, you'll give your life for them. And you'll, if you see them being pulled out to sea, you'll get out there and help them. If you see them about to be ready to go off the cliff, you, you try to stop them. I talked about that a lot, a lot in the last two sermons. The last couple of verses of James says, If someone has departed from the faith, departed from the faith, our attitude is not, hey, they depart, it's their problem. They took their eyes off God. No, no, no. Our attitude should be, oh, no, that's my brother. That's a fellow sheep. The lion, Satan's about ready to grab him. I have a responsibility to my brother. I am my brother's keeper and my sister's keeper. And we go search for the lost sheep and we protect each other and we love each other. So as we come to baptism, we understand the concept of becoming part of God's children and his family. You'll become a part of the body of Christ. You'll also become a part of each other, of one another, as Romans 12.5 says. 
This is all part of your commitment of what you're coming to. We're also called to do good works. We're saved by grace for good works, it says in Ephesians 2.10. We're saved by grace through faith for good works. We're called to be lights in a darkened world, not just go off by ourselves someplace. It all takes time, but it's all part of what you're committing to and what we're counting as we, the counting the cost as we undertake this thing of immersion. Now, repentance, Peter said, must be the first thing. Now, they didn't have to go home. I, I, this is very important. They were there at church services, if I could put it that way. They had just heard a rousing sermon by Peter. They'd witnessed some incredible things. They were pricked in their heart. They were moved. They were touched. They did not have to go home first and fast for a week or fast for a day for, and do, do eight lessons of Bible study courses and everything else that some people require. Peter simply said, repent. Turn around right now. Make it your heart's desire right now. Confess your sins right now. Be sorrowful with a godly sorrow right now. And that right now turned into 3,000 people being baptized that very day. So repentance is a whole topic by itself. I want to try to hit the high points here. We're called by God. We enter into the one door of the tabernacle complex. If we go back to tabernacle symbolism for just a second. What's the first thing you see as you open, as you go through the entrance, through the gate? The one entrance. There's one way into the tabernacle complex. One. And that was only through Yeshua. No other name given under heaven that, by which you may be saved. Acts 4.12. What's the first thing you see as you come into the complex? You see the altar of sacrifice where innocent animals were slain, where blood was being spilled, to symbolize that we have to accept the blood of the Lamb of God on our behalf to cover and pay for our horrible sins. Someone who did nothing wrong, because you see the wages of sin is death, we were doomed to die, but Yahweh offered his son in our stead, all of which will be pictured by Passover, which is coming up in just a couple, a few weeks here. Before baptism, there has to be genuine repentance. But understand this too, we also grow before baptism, genuine repentance. We must also grow, we will also grow in the understanding of what repentance is. This is a huge point. I think God's merciful not to let us see the entirety of how awful we really are all at once. Or we'd be too discouraged. But on the other hand, and I'll tell you now, in the years ahead, you may even wonder if you ever even properly repented. As you contrast your understanding, much deeper understanding of what repentance is all about 20 years from now, than what you understand it today. A lot of that should be expected. I'm telling you that right now, that you will grow in the vital understanding of even repentance. There's true repentance and there's false repentance. True repentance proves that it's repentant by having visible changes, some real fruit. And, and you know, initially, what do we do? We change, we, we, we keep, we don't keep Christmas anymore. It's more than just being about Christmas. It's more than just keeping the right day about Sabbath. It's more than if you had, if you were a wild person and a guy with really super long hair, you, you, you read the verse that, you know, God, God's not pleased with that, so you, you look more respectable and cut your hair and, it, those are, sure, those are evidences of change. You no longer eat pork or lobster. Okay, that's an evidence of change. And those are important things to do. But the real change, comes in our heart, brethren, the changes of wanting to be humble, wanting to be giving and loving, tired of being so selfish and gossipy and vain. That takes so much more. And it's harder to see those changes because they take so long sometimes. Some people may, may do it quickly, but anyway, false repentance is temporary. It's more of a sorrow that you got caught let me caution again, when you repent, even with a godly repentance, neither does it mean that you'll never slip again or, or that you didn't repent the first time. 
Most of us have weaknesses that may take years and years to overcome. Some of us have slipped back into sin from time to time. Abraham lied about his wife, Sarah, more than once. Yeshua spoke of a time when a brother might come to you seven times in one day. And seven times say, I repent. And seven times we are to forgive him, even though it would be likely that we'd be very tempted to give a lecture on the second or third time, let alone the seventh. How can you say you've repented and you keep doing it seven times in one day? Because I think he's trying to teach us that we do the same thing to him. Many, many times a day, a week, we come back and ask forgiveness. And he could say, well, when are you ever going to change that? So Luke 17, verses 3 and 4, is that passage about seven times in a day. Now, the woman caught in adultery. Don't, don't tell, you know, Yeshua says, don't be telling the person you didn't repent just because you slipped up again. The woman caught in adultery in, 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 in John 8, 11, she was told, go and sin no more. We know that. But what would Yeshua had done, have done if she came back or was caught again in a week or so with another adultery or, or a month later or a year later? Would she not have been forgiven that next time? Would he have said she never really did repent the first time? Many, many, many thousands of you would, would say, yeah, she didn't repent. But my point is, brethren, that knowledge of Scripture, you look at King David, who had God's Spirit. Was he not a man of God because he did some horrible things, including murder? One of his top men to grab his only wife that he had, and David had all these wives. And Paul still says in Romans 7, that which I hate, I still do. So we still sometimes do sin the same sins. How about sins like being lax on Sabbath keeping, shading the truth, losing patience, losing our temper, coveting. That's a big one, easy one. Our tongues. How many times do we sin with our tongue? Because if we can perfectly control our tongues, we'd be perfect, James says. James 3, verse 1 and 2. Don't all of us from time to time say things and gossip once in a while? That has to stop, of course. But my point is, I'm trying to say, ask forgiveness. And then prove you're sorry by turning around, going the other way. But neither do I subscribe to the harsh judgmental condemnations that some make when they hear of a brother or sister's tragic sin and they say something awful. He or she can't be converted. They must have never repented. I'm not going to make that judgment call because I don't want that judgment call made on me. I've certainly done many things after my baptism that are horrifyingly bad. And so have you. And like I said, even David said, long after his sins with Uriah and Bathsheba, David was still able to pray, Take not your spirit from me, O God. So when we come before God, and remember God's prophets did have the Holy Spirit. Now, it wasn't given in mass to all kinds of people, but the individual prophets did have God's Holy Spirit. You think I'm wrong? Go and read it for yourself. First Peter 1. Verses 10 and 11. It says it very clearly there, and I can show you many, many other places. But anyway, what is repentance? Repentance obviously includes contrition. Feeling sorry you did the wrong thing. I mean, it has to include that. I've heard sermons preached where people say it's not saying you're sorry. It includes that. David was very deeply moved by his in his repentance. The publican at the temple could not lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat upon his breast. Is that not contrition? Is that not sorrow? Of course it is. But it's more than that. It is turning around, yes. When Pharisees came to John's baptism, he told them in Matthew 3, verse 8, produce the fruits worthy of repentance. We'll read more about that later. Now, if you're coming to baptism, learn all you can about repentance. Read the description of a good repentant group in 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 to 12, describing their godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow, describing their zeal and their vehemence and their desire to change. Study Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. I'm not going to turn to these because this is not a sermon on repentance. It's a sermon on immersion. 
Luke 18, verses 9 to 14, the publican and the other guy who was, went to the temple to pray, the publican and the uh, Pharisee. I'd like, to get, I'd like you to get out of concordance and read every single passage you can. By the way, you can also get this free software called eSword, E-Sword, and download much of the Bible, uh, all the Bible, and many, many, many Bible helps, almost free or somewhere totally free. Recommend you do that if you have a, a good computer. I'd also study David's prayer, Psalm 51, in careful detail. And uh, this is not a sermon on repentance, like I said, but one who's truly repentant is now experiencing also uh, brokenness and uh, humility, sorrow, uh, plus a vehement desire to get it right this time. And they're able to forgive themselves and eventually, hopefully soon, enjoy joy again, like David describes in Psalm 51. So when we repent, we tell God we're sorry that we did bad things, we broke his law, First John 3, 4, we, t- we tell God we're sorry we didn't do things we should have done and knew better to do. He who knows to do good and does not to him it's sin, James 4, 17. And we repent for being a sinner, like the publican in Luke 18. God, forgive me. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so I'm going to put on a, a sermon soon on the website, uh, one of the sermons I gave in 1989 in a church congregation of about two or 300 people. And check it out, as soon as we can get it on there, repenting of what we are. And that's part of it. That's part of it. So that's part of what repentance is. Then you count the cost. I'm way behind, so I've got to speed up here. In Luke 14, verses 25 to 33, I'm just going to allude to it here to catch up a little bit. Luke 14, verses 25 to 33. If you're coming to baptism, you must carefully read that passage. And you must carefully analyze it word for word. Luke 14, 25 to 33. When multitudes came, they went to him and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and doesn't love less, that's what hate in the Hebraic sense meant. If you don't love your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and your own life less than mine, that's what he means, not, not hate them because we're not supposed to hate anybody. He cannot be my disciple. You have to love God more than yourself, more than your parents, more than any kids you have. That will be a horrible test for each of us at different times, different ways. We have to be willing to carry our cross. We have to be willing to count the cost if we can go all the way with this. And we're really making that commitment. So before your baptism, be sure you've decided in prayer on our knees that Yahweh is number one in our life. You're committing to put him and his son ahead of everything else. Ahead of your children, ahead of your husband, ahead of your wife. Or you cannot be his disciple. We have to be willing to bear our cross and follow him. Sometimes that might imply times in our lives when, why do I have to bear a cross? Can't he take this cross off of me? Can't he heal me? Can't he give me a job? Can't he make my daughter feel better? But if that was always answered quickly and suddenly, there's no cross-bearing that way. There will be times we will be disappointed with Yahweh, who could have done something, but from our perspective, didn't. But in all of this, we're committing to, regardless, Lord, I am yours and you are mine. I trust you and I wait for you. I have a good friend and his wife, Ian and uh, Thalia Houghton, whose son is, has been in a coma all week after a terrible motorcycle accident and a head injury. Please be praying for them. But as I preach this part here, I'm thinking of them. They're bearing their cross. They must do it patiently. And those of us praying for Philip Houghton must do it patiently. So blessed are you. We also are, I'm going to read this first, in the future we might be heavily persecuted. Objects of derision and scorn. Luke 6, 22 and 23 says, Luke 6, 23, 20, 22, 23 says, When they exclude you, revile you, hate you, cast you out as evil, for the Son of Man's sake, rejoice. That's, what they, that's the way they treated the prophets. That's okay. Now this topic of counting the cost can be a full-fledged sermon all by itself. So your assignment, if you're coming to baptism, study these passages in Luke 14, 
verses 25 to 32, very, very carefully. And ask yourself in prayer and before God, am I ready for this? Anyway, so repent, count the cost, find a faithful minister, and get baptized. As I stood there dripping wet December 1971, the minister then bowed his head, laid his hands on my head, and asked God to give me his Holy Spirit through the laying on of his hands. I was 18 years old. I felt washed. I felt renewed. I felt happy. I felt emotional. I felt forgiven. Blessed, happy is he whose sins are forgiven. I felt that. I'm going to warn you also, those of you coming to baptism, I want this to be a real sort of uh, just a brotherly talk to somebody who, you know, and I've certainly failed a lot in my life, and I've had some successes in my life through, the God, through God's Spirit. And I failed when I didn't use God's Spirit. But sometime later, I began to second guess. Did I repent? Did the minister have any God's Holy Spirit? Am I converted now? And I think many of us have those questions, because guess what? We're still flesh and blood. We still have some human nature in us. Too many times, even though we now have God's Spirit, guess what? We still give in to the flesh. Sometimes that comes as a huge surprise if the pastor didn't explain it beforehand. Even after baptism, 1 John 2.17 shows we'll sometimes give in to the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, lust of the eyes, all of the things that can just catch us up and sin so easily can so easily beset us. And so the Holy Spirit gives us God's nature, true. And we are to walk with that nature. We are to feed that nature. We are to follow that nature. We are to listen to that nature. And God's nature is talked about in Second Peter 1, the first four verses. Second Peter 1, verses 2 to 4. That we have become partakers of the divine nature. Uh, which is given us that pertain to life and godliness, partakers of the divine nature, the divine power and the divine nature are both mentioned there. So we have to let that mind be in us. We have to put on the new nature. We have to put on the, uh, the armor of God. And we have to fight, not as a shadow boxer, but for real. We have to resist things. We're being told if it's fun, do it. If you can get away with it, do it. If no one will catch you at it, do it. And I've been tempted that way, and you have. And we have to grow up and be, be per, become perfect, grown up, matured in Christ. So we learn that even though we have God's Spirit, boy, we still have all of our human nature as well. And these two natures are constantly at war. They fight each other. The nature which will win will be the one we feed the most, the one we listen to the most, the one we strengthen the most. Galatians 5, turn with me to Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. I just want this to be sort of a, an indoctrination into somebody getting baptized that here's what you can expect. There's some wonderful, wonderful times with God's Spirit, and there's some wonderful times you wonder, did I even have or use God's Spirit? Boy, I really, really, really stunk in that performance. Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, listen to God's Spirit. Feed that Spirit by Bible study. Feed that Spirit by lots of prayer. Feed that Spirit by fellowshipping with people of converted like mind and getting their thoughts. Read the right things. We listen to that crap in our television from our television in our living room, brethren, and I call it that on purpose. I know there's a sermon, but I want you to hear the word. That's what a lot of it is. We have these expanded channels. I don't get HBO. I don't get that kind of stuff because there's no way that any of that is something I want in my home. But even though I don't get any premium channels, I'm amazed at what's allowed late at night nowadays. Bad, horrible language. God's name in vain. We can't have that in our home. We mustn't do that. We mustn't let God's name be trashed like that in a place where we have control. Walk in the Spirit. Don't let these things make you un unsatisfied with the things we have and start to lust after somebody else's wife or the concept of it or somebody else's husband or the money or the power. 
Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that they don't do the things you wish. You see, we're going to have a fight, and so that's why we don't always do the things we wish, he says. So I only speak about this war that goes on, because so many get discouraged after being baptized. Don't, brethren, don't let it happen to you that way. Um, when scripture speaks of perfection and being perfect, the Greek word means to be mature and grown up. I personally don't think we'll ever be perfect. I know some of you disagree with that. But I don't think we'll ever be perfect in the English sense of the word, meaning without any flaw, without any mar, without any sin, without any defects, until we're changed. Christ is the one who will work to remove the spots and the wrinkles and over, and over time present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. That's what it says in Ephesians. And he gave himself for his bride <clears throat> that he might present it to himself a glorious church. A lot of that has to do with the series I gave on righteousness. So please hear those sermons too. We have to accept his life for us in faith. We're saved by grace through faith for good works, but good works don't save us. Faith and grace save us. But we must live with good works. That's what pure religion is all about. And that's what James 1 says, the bridle of the tongue or your religion is worthless and take care of the widows and orphans and keep yourself unspotted from the world. All right, let's get back to some nitty gritty. Page 9 or so of my notes, I go in more depth as to what that baptism definitely means to be immersed. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now because I think the audience who hear me already know that part. If you are one of these who believes that baptism should include infant sprinkling baptism, then study this part very carefully. Look at the word in, a, in, a, in the Greek, baptizo, the verb, is to immerse, to put into. And I'll just quickly go over these things without turning to them, but they're in my notes if you want to read more detail on them. It says John the baptizer went to this place in the River Jordan because there was much water there. And the fact that we're buried with Christ in baptism, sprinkling doesn't bury you. You see, you lose the whole symbolism if you just, if you don't do the, the immersion part. And uh, Matthew 3, it says that many people came to John in the River Jordan and in the Jordan, in the Jordan, confessing their sins. They wouldn't have to be there where there's much water. They could just have a a bucket of water and sprinkle people and the next person, next person, and so on. No, that's not what they did. And then, <clears throat> let's talk about this too now. Romans 10, turn, turn there with me. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. I think part of baptism, and I don't know that the Church of God groups have done this enough like we should have. I think maybe we do right as a ritual at the time of baptism. But I think we need to be preaching to people. This Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> that there is a public confession that Yeshua is now your Savior. Yeshua now is your Lord. He now is your Master. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. You're not ashamed of Him. You speak up for Him. <clears throat> Give an example as you turn to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. I had an appointment the other day, and uh, this man uh, somehow... I don't know how it came up. To, what was it? I saw his clock, and it was in, in a 24-hour time. And I said, were you in the military? He said, yes. And he wondered how I picked up on it. But, you know, when you're trained as, a, as a, an agent to pick up on things. And I often try to pretend I'm not noticing things, but, but I, I am. And, uh, and then a few minutes later, he talks about learning Latin. I asked him if he was uh, Catholic by any chance. And he says, oh, no, I'd never do that. And, and from there we went into... How there is no God, he said, there is no creator, there is no Jesus. There, and he went on and on and on. And at some point, my spirit inside of me, I couldn't let them say all these horrible things he started to say about God. And I said, what you're saying about religion is true. But I want you to know, I believe in God, that there is a creator, that I have a savior named Jesus Christ. And I told him that, and he was stunned. He looked at me like nobody had ever said that to him. And I said, you can believe what you believe, but I want you to know there is a Savior, there is a God in heaven, 
and someday you will meet him, and someday you will love him. And he, he looked at me just stunned. Did I make the sale? No. <laughs> Was it worth it? I could have had thousands of dollars, and I would have felt like I sold my Savior or, kicked or threw him under the bus if I had kept silent. And we left on good terms. He asked me to explain why I would think that. An educated man like you, how could you possibly think that? And I reversed it on him. How could an educated man like you possibly not think that? And we went back to it. But anyway, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, mouse, <laughs> with your mice, with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We need to speak up. We need to identify more with him. Turn now to Acts 8, verses 36 to 39. There's a lot here I need to talk about. <clears throat> Acts 8, verses 36 to 39. This is the baptism and conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And I'll pick up in Acts 8, verse 36. Philip, the originally a deacon, probably evangelist by this time, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. This is after Philip had explained to him about who Messiah was and all that. And the eunuch said, Look, there's water here. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, Philip didn't even know this man, had never met him before. He didn't say, well, let's see, we have four booklets we want you to read and six cassette tapes and seven CDs and come to church for a while and you got to do this and do that. No, 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 no. Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. doesn't even say repent here in this place. But that's part of believing, isn't it? And then he answered and said, I believe that Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And he got out of his Lamborghini. <laughs> this was a rich man. And both Philip and Eunuch went down into the water. Here again we have, and he immersed him. We miss, we miss some of the meaning when we say baptize. It simply means he immersed him. But there's a lot going on here. Your faith in God's ability to save you. Giving your heart and declaring that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then not putting it off. Not putting it off at all once you're ready. If I hear people being counseled for months on end, there's no biblical, there's no biblical precedent for that. Brethren, there isn't. There really isn't. I want to say this too, that your faith in God's, abil God's ability to save you not your own ability to save yourself. We save ourselves by accepting God's life for us and showing faith in Him. But even the verse commonly overworked verse, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12, goes on to say a part of the, the very next verse. I hardly ever, ever hear people read it. This salvation is by God, brethren. This creation is, is His creation. 1 Corinthians 1, 29-31 says that no man can boast. That no man can boast. He saves us. He grants us His righteousness. Now we have to live in that righteousness and follow it and work with it and show we're using it and living by it. Don't, don't accuse me of teaching, um, you know, just that we can do whatever we want. That's not at all what I'm saying here. Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, and here's the big part everyone quotes, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And they stop. What does verse 13 say? For it is God. It is who? It is God who works in you, both to will, as to want to do it, and to actually do it. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And that's why everything in Scripture talks about God, our righteousness. It's the armor of God. It's God, our righteousness. 
holiness unto God, a holiness unto Yahweh. He supplies it. It is his righteousness that will save us, and no flesh can boast. Now, how old should a person be before they come to baptism? Let's cover a few quick questions. Um, there's nothing in Scripture that says you can't baptize children, I mean babies. And there's nothing in Scripture that says any babies or young children were ever baptized either. So you can't base it on what Scripture says. Um, there is a part where in Acts 2.39, I think it is, where Peter says, for this is to you and your children. Of course, I have children, and they're all in their late 20s or 30s now, early 30s. Um, Jesus himself was 30 when he was baptized, as an example for us. Uh, whole households were baptized, but the youngest ones were never are never disclosed as far as their ages go. They could be, they all could be certainly uh, 20 and up or something like that. Who knows? Uh, bottom line is this: when you understand that it's a commitment to marry, would you let a child make that decision? When you understand that it's a commitment to understand what you're doing, to count the cost, to be willing to die for this. To go all the way, to repent, to be deeply sorry, to understand what you have to repent of. That is not something that children can grasp in the same way. I personally would be reluctant to baptize anyone younger than 17 or 18. I, I, I would. Sometimes wonder if I was old enough when I got baptized. often wonder that. Who should do the baptizing? It doesn't seem to me that the one who immerses you is someone all that important in a, in a sense. Paul made a point to say he personally did not do a lot of baptizing. That's in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 to 16. Yeshua said he didn't baptize people. That's John 4, verses 1 to 3, except for very few. He let his disciples, who weren't even converted in the sense that they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet, he let them do the baptizing. So this was a baptism unto repentance up to that point, kind of like John's baptism. And Ananias, the one who baptized Paul, or Saul as he was called at that point, was listed only as a disciple in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9. So, um, um, I see no problem uh, with a father assisting a pastor in the baptism of his adult children. I see no problem with that. Now, laying on of hands is another matter. That should be from an ordained minister. We see the example in Acts 8 where after Philip had baptized a bunch of people in Samaria, the church sent out Peter and John to follow up on Philip's baptism. Now again, how soon should a person be baptized once they know they've repented and accepted Jesus Christ and Yeshua Messiah as their Master and Savior? 3,000 were baptized in one day. 3,000 in Acts 2. We see the Ethiopian eunuch immediately baptized. We see Lydia and her household baptized immediately. We see Cornelius and his household in Acts 10 immediately baptized. There's no such thing as pre-baptism counseling as we see it and know it. It just isn't. There just isn't. So um, please be aware of that, brethren. Please be aware of that. Now, in whose name should we be baptized? This is going to be interesting because... There is a verse in Matthew 28:19. Matthew 28:19, there is a verse that's commonly used that says we are to Matthew 28:19 that says we are to be baptized into the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, into the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, think about that for a second. Now, we, when we look at every other passage that I can think of and look up, it says that when people actually were baptized or told how to be baptized, it was something different. I am leaning myself to the belief that something was doctored up in that verse because otherwise, when Jesus, if Jesus said to baptize everybody into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, Peter and Paul and everybody else disobeyed because they didn't. Okay, I'll read a whole bunch to you to make my point. Acts 2.38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 8.14, And they had only been baptized in the name of Lord, Lord Jesus. Acts 19.5, I just want you to hear the, the sequence because of time here. They were baptized into Christ that put on Christ. Acts 2.38, Repent, be baptized. I said that. Acts 10.48. 
and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Uh, Romans 6, 3. Now, some are going to say, yeah, that's in, by the authority. In the name of means in the authority of Jesus. But, it, but it, there's no formula like Matthew 28, 19 here. Do you not know that many of us who were baptized into, there's the into now, not just in the name of, but into, we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Of course, when we've received the Holy Spirit, we are literally baptized into his one body. So I think that that's um, unfortunate editing that went on there, but... Um, should you be baptized in, 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 in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of Yeshua the Messiah? You know what? Don't go there. Just either one you want to pick. They're both fine. And um, don't make a big deal of that. Now, other types of immersions. I'm almost out of time here. I'm going to leave you to study a lot of this in, in your notes. The Bible speaks of Noah's flood being a type of immersion because they were in it and over it and the cloud and the water above and around and beneath them. And they came through it, the eight who were baptized through the flood. The eight who came through it were the ones who were considered baptized. Not the ones who just died. But remember, baptism pictures coming through and the resurrection as well. Not just the burial. Okay? So, the, it was the eight. The eight were the ones who were baptized in First Peter 3, 20 to 22. Eight souls were saved through water. That's an antitype which now saves us baptism, okay? Uh, the Red Sea was considered a baptism. They were all baptized into Moses. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. We had more time on this. I'm going to skip some stuff here. Baptism and immersion also is pictured by our willingness to go through anything God wants us to go through. Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? I'm on page 12 of my notes here. Now, there's... Two other baptisms I want to talk about. Three. Uh, water baptism, of course, we've been talking about it. And then there's baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there's baptism of fire. All three are mentioned in Matthew 3, verses 7 to 12 by John. Matthew 3, verses 7 to 12, where he tells the Pharisees that, look, he says, I indeed, uh, first of all, he starts off by saying, you brood of vipers, he's angry at them, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Don't think to yourselves, hey, we have Abraham, we're good. Okay? Verse 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So notice the context of the fire is a bad tree bearing bad fruit that is cut down and thrown into a fire to be burned up. There's a good sermon by Ben Faulkner on his website, uh, uh, www.cotsg.org, cotsg.org, where he goes into the doctrine of baptisms. He spends quite a bit more time on this baptism of fire in his sermon than I'll have time to. I recommend you hear it. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. That's the baptism you and I were baptized with, and we had the laying on of hands. So we got the second part. But he is coming with me as mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, the Holy Spirit baptism happened in Acts, Acts chapter 2. The fire part, he goes on to explain, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. What's, what do you burn up in the threshing floor? It's the chaff, it's the stuff, it's the junk that you can't use, that is not useful. And gather his wheat into the barn and burn up the rest. Okay, so the baptism of fire is not something we want. That is not something we want. That has to do with the lake of fire, and that is not something we want. Water baptism, we've been talking about, is a baptism of repentance, remission of sins. That's the baptism of John. And then in Acts 1, in Acts 1, just before the Feast of Pentecost, Yeshua says to his disciples in Acts 1, verses 4 to 5, I'm having to hurry because of time, I'm sorry, but being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And he says, For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so that's what happened in Acts 2. And... Um, 
basically, I think we all know that when we're baptized, the next thing that happens is we come out of the water or the river, and we have the um, minister lay his hands on us, and he asks God to give us the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is, is next. You do not want the baptism of fire. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what baptizes you into the body of Christ. And that's what makes you part of his body. And I believe this is the most important baptism of all. Because going in under the water and back up is a ritual symbolizing what we've done in our heart. But it's the actual receiving, the anointing, the baptism of God's Holy Spirit that will make you a member of God's family and make you able to be part of that team that God is putting together and to the bride of Christ. I'm out of time. And... Um, so I think that that's the baptism that counts the most. And if any of you are coming to baptism and immersion, God bless you. Don't delay. Let me know. I'd like to welcome you into the family of God. Actually, Ananias called Saul, uh, brother Saul, even before his baptism. But I'd like to welcome you as a new brother and sister in Christ. Even my own daughters, when they were baptized, I rejoiced. I gave them a hug. And I said, welcome to God's family, my, my new sisters. Because even though they were my flesh and blood daughters... Spiritually, they were now also my sisters. We have such a high calling, brethren. Immersion is such a huge and important step, not to be taken lightly. But once you repent, accept our Master as your Savior and King, and wish to be immersed in His way, don't delay. It's not going to be long now before all God's children will come together as one and celebrate the marriage to the Son of God, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and you can be called to be part of His very body and his bride. Isn't that amazing? It all starts with repentance and faith in him and then baptism and laying on of hands. Get ready for Passover. Enjoy it. Count the cost. Praise God. Until next time, this is your brother in Christ, in Yeshua Messiah, Philip Shields. Bye-bye for now. I love you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>